All right, so this is this is part three of Sander Cooper's mini course on homological stability. Okay, yeah, so, okay, if you saw me frowning just before, it was because I realized that the nodes have a small typo in them, so I'll, for the second lecture, so I'll upload or send a correction out. Um, it's just a range that's like one wrong, but it got me very confused for a minute here. Um, because what I'm gonna do is uh, explain the end of the proof of the theorem that's stated here, which is homological stability for symmetric groups. And we did two of the three steps already. Uh, the first one was use that a certain semi-simplicial set of injective words is highly connected to replace in a homotopy quotient the point by this semi-simplicial set, and then use the filtration that comes with the geometric realization to get a spectral sequence. And what we did last time before the end was show that the E1 page looks as you can see over here. The spectral sequence really converged to the homotopy quotient of this geometric realization by sigma n plus one, but in the range of interest, that's the same as the homology of the n plus first symmetric group. So this spectral sequence will be used to prove the homological stability result. An important thing to observe is that the D1 differential is alternatively the zero map and the stabilization map. And in particular, it's stabilization maps between classifying space of symmetric groups where we already know the homological stability result. So what's going to happen is that when we pass to the E2 page and we take homology with respect to the D1 differential, a lot of things are going to vanish. And that's going to allow us to prove the stability result. Okay, so there'll be two different cases. Um, the reason is that, I mean, you can maybe imagine that the fact that these ranges involve division by two that the case where n is odd and when n is even are going to be slightly different in terms of the argument that you're going to have to do. And instead of writing down somehow explicitly, just in terms of symbols, when this E2 page vanishes and what conclusions you're going to draw from that, I'm just going to do two particular cases that I think are going to be illustrative of what happens in general. I mean, once you see those, you can do the general case as well. So I'm going to do the case when uh, n is eight and when n is nine. The case A being when n is even and case B being when n is odd. Okay. So, so what do we know? Um, in this case, we, we can get a lot of vanishing on the E2 page already from our induction hypothesis. Okay, so let's go. This is gonna be the E2 page. Let's go back and look at the previous page. So this first column is gonna survive intact. The D1 differential into it is just zero. The first column being, being this guy. But it's gonna be a range in which these guys are gonna cancel each other out. Because sigma is gonna be an isomorphism or rejection. And it's triangle shaped as I've indicated where the diagonal line will have slope minus one half. Okay, so what is it gonna look like explicitly in this case? So here we're gonna get the the homology of B sigma eight, that's going to appear on this column. Um, and then there's gonna be um, vanishing in the, in the following region. Um, okay, so let me try and draw a little marks. So these are the P's, 
the max here. Just the queues. And if you work out the ranges, which I'm going to do on the fly because I'm going to correct a little typo, um, what you get is vanishing in the first column for the first th uh, three entries. So these are going to be zeros. Let me just put dots for that and then some mystery stuff. Um, that's going to go down by one degree. Etc. So every time you move two over in the p direction, there's two less degrees in which you have information. So these little tiny dots are zeros, and the stars are things we don't know. Okay. And this was converging to the homology of the ninth symmetric group. Um, degree p plus q. OK, so what's going to happen? Um, the contribution to degree 0 of the homology of the nine symmetric group is just going to be this bottom entry here. The homology, the contribution to the first degree is going to be all the entries on this line. The only non-zero entry there is this guy. And the same thing is going to happen for a bit. Okay, so the first, in this case, three homology groups are going to be the same for the eight symmetric group and the nine symmetric group. Something, you expect something similar to happen for the fourth homology group, except one thing can happen. There can be a differential, B2 differential coming in from over here. And so what you get for this fourth group is not the same homology as that of sigma eight, but a quotient of it. Maybe the quotient by the image of that D2 differential. So the conclusion is that in these first homology groups, you're gonna get that the civilization map is an isomorphism. And in this last degree here, it's gonna give you a subjection. Okay, so that concludes the inductive step in one case. How is the other case going to be different? Um, it's going to be slightly different in the sense that you get a tiny bit more information from your induction hypothesis. So let's see here, we have H star B sigma 10. And now where we have information, um, it's going to look as follows. Uh, you're right, that's B sigma 9. Sorry, it's going to converge to B sigma 10. Thank you. Um, OK. You'll have a very similar looking pattern of groups that you know and groups that you don't know, except you have a little bit more information in the beginning. So the pattern is maybe going to look like this. And so now it's the case that not only do you get these first uh, homology groups, the same for B sigma 9 as B sigma 10, but also the next one, because this, oh, they click to remove it. because the differential that was causing issues before now has a zero source. So this is just a zero map. So 
in this case, you get information in the first. five degrees. So now you get an isomorphism here. Okay, and you can see that you can bootstrap this pattern further. I mean, the notes write out the, the statement for all B and Qs, but I think once you've seen these two pictures, I think you've seen the important cases. Okay. So the important thing in the spectral sequence argument was this alternating pattern of zeros and stabilization maps, and then using the inductive hypothesis to make this triangle area composed of zeros, which tells you that the homology of the leftmost column and of the, is the same as the abutment in the range. And then it's just some careful bookkeeping to make sure the induction works. Okay, so that is in principle the proof at least in these illustrative cases, except for one step that we still need to do, um, which last time I postponed to this lecture. And that's proving that this space that you get by taking the geometric realization of WN1, that that's homologically highly connected. Okay, so if there's no questions about this last spectral sequence step, um, I'm gonna prove that now. Really quickly, I think you already mentioned, but of course, the, the maps that come from the E to what is it, zero Q to the target are indeed in deep space sigma. So that's why you can compute here, right? Yeah, you have to verify, I guess, that you know, I, I think about you this mentioned more. it. I think, I think you mentioned it last time. So I was yeah. just trying to refresh my memory. Okay. Yeah, so you do need to know that you, if indeed proven that the stabilization map is an isomorphism, not some other map. Yeah using this argument. There is a way of making that a bit cleaner. You see, it's not so nice to have an argument where somehow the homology of the symmetric group you're converging to plays a slightly different role than the other columns in the spectral, spectral sequence. So instead you can set up a geometric, an augment, yeah, a geometric realization spectral sequence for an augmented semi-simplicial space. And that will have a minus one column which contains the thing you're converging to in this case. And then it, that spectral sequence will converge to zero in a range. And that's a bit of a cleaner argument, since in that case, it's more obvious that the map you're proving is an isomorphism, um, it's a stabilization map. But I didn't want to introduce augmented semi-simplicial sets in this lecture series. But you'll see them in uh, many of the papers on homological stability, since it makes arguments a bit cleaner. But we still have to prove this crucial step. And as we'll soon see when I write down what we actually used about symmetric groups, this is really the crux of the argument, which is the connectivity of that uh, WN1 space. So let me prove that for you. So I'm gonna remind you of the definition in a second, but what we want to prove is that this is homologically n minus one over two connected. Okay, so it's reduced homology vanishes in that range. Um, I should say, actually it's much more highly connected. It's in fact, n minus two connected. And in the notes, you'll be able to find many references for this fact. But this proposition is the only thing we need for our argument and it admits a rather simple proof. The difficulty with that proof is that it basically only works in this particular case, and it doesn't really help you prove connectivity results for other homological stability arguments. So in the exercise, you can find a different argument that is more likely to help you prove other homological stability results. Okay, so let me just remind you what the definition is of this semi-simplicial set W one. So as any simple semi-simplicial set, it has sets of p-simplices for each p greater than equal to zero, which are going to be given by injective functions from 
the ordered set zero up to p to the set of elements one up to n. The functions don't have to preserve any order. Um, and the face maps are given by precomposition. In other words, they just delete an element from your sequence. Okay, so at this point, it's helpful to maybe write um, W of N bullet. for this semi-simplicial set and realize that I could have taken any other finite set instead of N, in fact, any set. Because in the argument, I'm gonna vary those. And I don't want to be confined to just having an integer indexing them. Okay, so let's give the proof. So um, the proof will again be an induction. And I'm going to assume the cases n less than equal to three. So two of those we did last time. Uh, n is one, which has really not much to prove, and n is two. Um, n is three, uh, there's an exercise about that one. You have to prove it's uh, simply connected in that case. Okay, so we'll prove um, this result for some n greater than equal to four, knowing all the previous cases. Okay. Wait, could I ask the, in the subscript n that you had before, I mean, is this s playing the role of the target now? So the same n that, that is the subscript now? Or... Yes, s, s plays the role of the target. So how would you define ws? Um, you would replace this n by an s. Right. So the one that you had before is a different parameter that we're not. The one you'll see later in this lecture, um, it is the thing you're stabilizing with. And if you're in a different setting, the one would be replaced by whatever you're stabilizing with in that case. Okay. And n is the number of times you stabilize with it. So this is an instance of a very general construction. So I wanted to have the notation there. Right. Okay. So um, this geometric realization um, is built by gluing together simplices. So it comes with a CW structure. Right, where just every simplex gives you a cell. And I can write down quite explicitly uh, an n minus two skeleton for it as follows. So let me define Si to be n with the i element removed. So i here runs from one up to n. Then I can define W of SI. Um, w of SI is naturally a sub semi simplicial set of WN. And I could take the union of all of these. So this is an inclusion, and this is an N minus two skeleton. You see, as long as you restrict your attention only to less than equal to n minus two simplices, you can never see more than n minus one elements of your finite set n. So it has to be contained in one of these guys. Um, okay. And since 
we assume that n is at least four. Um, well, no, we don't need it yet. Yeah. What we'll use instead is the following. Um, This implies that the induced map on homology is a surjection for a star less than or equal to n minus two, right? In fact, it's an isomorphism for star less than or equal to n minus three, but we won't need that. Um, and we'll use that n minus two is greater than equal to n minus one divided by two, when n is at least four. Okay, so in the range we're interested in, in the range we want to prove that the homology um, of the target vanishes, um, we know it's subjected upon by the homology of this subspace. So it will suffice us to prove that it will suffice to prove that the map is zero on homology in that range, because then subjective and a zero map. So that means that the target would have to be zero. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So to do that, we'll first prove the following. So each of these spaces, W of SI, um, of course, maps to the union so we get an induced map on homology. And we can take a direct sum of that, all those maps. So we first proved that this is subjective. Um, for star less than or equal to n minus two divided by n minus one divided by two. Um, and to do that, you recognize it as an edge homomorphism in the Maya via torus spectral sequence. Right, the Maya Viatora spectral sequence is a generalization of the Maya Viatora sequence for when you have more than two elements in your cover. In this case, it's not an open cover, but it's a cover by sub CW complexes. So we're fine. You could like slightly thicken these guys if you wanted to. So what does this look like? So it's the cover of this union by the cover of this union by each of these subspaces. So the spectral sequence will look as follows. In the pth column, you'll have p-fold intersections. Um, sorry, I have to add a plus one here. And it converges to the homology of the union. Okay. But now let's think about what these intersections look like. Um, if you intersect oh, actually, I should have started my the better thing to do would be start my indexing at zero.
the intersection of this just consists of the geometric realization of W of the intersection of the sets. And this is isomorphic, homeomorphic, to the geometric realization of something we saw before, but with less elements. And we know that this is homologically um, n minus p minus 2 connected. OK. So what we get is that um, there's going to be a triangle of this type of shape where the E1 page is going to vanish. But we're just going to ignore what happens on this column here. Not going to use induction hypothesis, in fact, for that case. So um, we're almost good in that sense in terms of the things appearing over here, um, surjecting onto the abutment. The only issue is the entries that live on the bottom row, which has some Zs. So you have to think a bit about what that chain complex looks like on the E1 page. So what appears here, what appears here is exactly the cellular chain complex of um, the boundary of an n minus one simplex. It's some z's indexed by uh, these terms here. And you have to think a bit about what the differential looks like. At any rate, once we pass through the E2 page, it's going to vanish in a range, the homology. So it vanishes for um, 0 smaller than p smaller than n minus 2. OK. So once we pass through the E2 page, we also get rid of this bottom row. And uh, if you work out the numbers, uh, everything's been set up so that this will imply the result that we want. The fact that n is at least four is necessary to make sure that this n minus two is not going to mess you up. So that's at least an outlined argument for the statement that this is a surjection. OK, so now we've proven that that, that map is a surjection. So what we get is the following. In the range we're interested in, this map is a surjection. And the second map is also a surjection. So this is only true in degrees star less than or equal to n minus one divided by two. So it will be enough to prove that whenever we take one of these cements here, and we map it to the bottom, it's enough to prove that this is the zero map in positive degrees. Because then it's both subjective and zero. And as I said before, that implies that the target is zero. Um, and that's because This inclusion is 
is no homotopic. Um, I don't want to give the details of this, but the idea is roughly that you can cone off using the point that you have removed. So there's an exercise that makes this precise. So using the element i in m. Okay. And that then finishes the proof. of the statement that this uh, WN1 is homologically N minus one over two connected, which was the main input for our argument. So, so this is, as far as I know, the shortest argument of this statement. And it's already like somewhat complicated and involves some, some trickery, right? You have to like come up with discover, uh, realize you want to prove that some map is both subjective and zero and then checks with something is no homotopic. And as we'll see later, these types of connectivity arguments are really the crux of any homological stability result. And you usually expect them to be difficult. And when you read a paper about homological stability, probably half of the length is going to be about proving that some complex is highly connected. OK. Any questions about this argument? If there are not, um, I want to explain what we actually used about symmetric groups uh, by explaining the framework of uh, Oscar and Williams and Natalie Val for proving homological stability results. So it makes a, it formalizes the argument that we've done for symmetric groups. It tells you what input you need for a sequence of groups to get this argument to go through. So what is the input for their framework? Um, well, you start with a symmetric monoidal groupoid. OK, so what does this mean? Well, a groupoid, of course, means a category where all objects so all morphisms are isomorphisms. And symmetric monoidal means that you have some kind of direct sum or tensor operation. Um, as well as an object one, which serves as its unit. And associativity and unitality isomorphisms relating these. Um, and finally, a symmetry isomorphism that swaps two elements. OK, so I'm not going to give the full details of that. You've either seen this or have not. If you haven't seen what a symmetric monoidal structure is, you should think in terms of examples that we've done so far, we've talked about so far, um, in the example, we've heard with so far, the symmetric monoidal or the groupoid is going to be the category of finite sets and bijections. And the symmetric monoidal structure is going to have disjoint union as its tensor product. And it's going to have the empty set as its unit. Okay, and disjoint union is associative, unital, and symmetric. I'll do another example later on. Okay, so whenever you have a symmetric monoidal groupoid like this, and you pick two objects. Uh, 
um, you can of course form this sum and you can look at the automorphisms of this object. All the morphisms from this object to itself. This will be a group because we're in a groupoid. So let's call that GN. This is some automorphism group. And there's going to be maps between these, which are going to be induced by adding another copy of X and taking the identity on that. Okay, so these are going to be some kind of stabilization maps. And now the general question you could ask is uh, when does the sequence of spaces B G zero to B G one to B G two, etc., exhibit homological stability. Okay. And an answer to that question is given by formalizing the argument we used for symmetric groups. So let's say that we have the same notation as before. So let's say G, A, and X as above. OK. So the conditions you, you need are as follows. First, it's going to be two easy conditions on G. Which, in fact, are not completely necessary, but I'll explain it in a second. So the first one is that you want the monoid of isomorphism classes of objects in G under the same operation to have cancellation. So if two things become isomorphic by after adding the same object to them, they were isomorphic already. And you want the induced map on automorphisms by summing with the identity to be injective. Once you have these conditions, then there are semi simplicial sets that I'll define in a second. WN AX. If you take A to be the unit, you usually drop A. Maybe now the notation for my WN1 becomes clear, such that the following is true. If there is a K greater than equal to two, search that these are homologically N minus two over K connected for all N is two. Then the map induced by sigma on homology this is surjective for star less than or equal to n over k and an isomorphism for star less than or equal to n minus one over k. OK. So um, these are some minor conditions that you can think of as just being mild, and most of your examples will satisfy them. Um, the crux is really this connectivity result. Of 
for these Ws. That's what you have to prove to get homological stability. Um, and the argument is basically the same at, at this point as for symmetric groups. Um, at least once I define what a W ends are. So let me comment a bit on what sense these conditions one and two are not really necessary. So I made a slight simplification when I stated this result. Um, it's not really necessary that G is symmetric. It's not that it's braided, which means that the symmetry doesn't square to the identity. And whenever you take the geometric realization of a braided monoidal groupoid, that becomes an E2 algebra that happens to consist of spaces that are k pi ones. It turns out that by work of Koenig, um, this type of result that I've written on the right is true whenever you input an E2 algebra. Um, in that case, the semi-simplicial sets become semi-simplicial spaces. And working that generality allows you to get rid of these mildness conditions. They serve to make sure that the semi-simplicial space that would appear in general remain or are semi-simplicial sets and not spaces. Um, so you can get rid of these conditions here if you're willing to work with E2 algebras. And replace the W ends by semi-simplicial sp spaces. It's, it's of course going to become harder to then prove that they're homologically highly connected. Okay. So let me give you the definition of these WNs and let's see that they exactly recover the WN ones that we've talked about before. Okay. So what are these? W in A axis. So what you do is you first build a different category from G. This is not so surprising since our construction of WN1, it didn't use finite sets and bijections. It used finite sets and injections. So it built something from the finite sets and bijections and then extracted a semi-simplicial set from that. So this is the generalization of that construction. So it has objects the same as G, but the morphisms are different. So the morphisms from X to Y are given by pairs F comma Z, where F is a morphism like this. So it's some kind of complement that you add up to an equivalence relation. Where we say that ZF is equivalent to Z prime F. If there is a commutative diagram, as follows. So um, a morphism in this category is like you add a, it's an inclusion of X into Y with a choice of complement. Maybe that's one way of saying it. Okay. So what is WN AX going to be given by then? Well, it's P simplices 
will be the morphisms in UG from a direct sum indexed by the P plus one elements in this ordered set into X A plus X to the N. So let me just do an example immediately. If G is finite sets and bijections, what is UG? Uh, UG will be finite sets and injections. Same object as before, but the morphisms are now injective functions. Okay, um, Z will play the role of the complement. And when we take W N of the empty set N1, which maybe you want to abbreviate as W N1, you get exactly the semi simplicial set we studied before. So taking this particular example, um, you realize that the connectivity result just proves fits into this general result of Vander Williams and Wild to give homological stability for symmetric groups. Um, let me give one more example of this. So what if we take um, G to be finitely generated abelian groups? And the isomorphisms. Okay. Um, this satisfies conditions one and two, basically by the classification of finally generated building groups. So, what are these? What are these semi-simplicial sets then? Um, their p-simplices are given by inclusions, roughly, of p copies or p plus one copies of z into z to the n, with which admit a complement, or maybe with a complement. And luckily, uh, Charney proved that these are highly connected. So we can directly feed her high connectivity result into this theorem and conclude. So her connectivity result is, uh, has k equal to one. So we're gonna get a slope one half homological stability result for the automorphisms of direct sums of copies of Z, which is GLN Z. So the consequence is homological Wait, stability. What was the question? What's the surname? I, I think I couldn't understand the. Um, He's asking about the last name, I think. Oh, Charney, Ruth Charney. Maybe you can write it again more clearly. You're asking what this name is here. I mean, you'll find. Detailed references in the in the notes. But the consequence is a homological stability result for the groups B, G, L, N, Z. Um, 
Okay. So let me give an application of this. So in the very first lecture, I gave a somewhat difficult proof of the fact that the stable homotopy groups for spheres were finite in positive degrees using homological stability. Um, let me now give a result that's of a similar flavor, but for which, as far as I know, there isn't an alternative proof that doesn't use homological stability, um, at least in some flavor which is the finite generation for the algebraic K-theory groups of the integers. Now, I'm not gonna define what the algebraic K-theory of the integers is, but I'm gonna tell you uh, one property that it has using the group completion theorem. So these are the homotopy groups of some spectrum K of Z, which is connective. And the infinite loop space of the spectrum, at least a single component of it, has the same homology as a stable homology of GLN Z. So this is proven using the group completion theorem, similar to what I discussed for symmetric groups and the sphere spectrum. Um, so once you have this information, you see that it suffices to prove that this term over here is finally generated in each degree. To prove that the same is true for these k groups of the integers. This is again a SER class argument. Once you know the homology is finally generated of a connected infinite loop space, uh, then you also know that the homotopy groups are finally generated and because it's a connective spectrum, you know the homotopy groups of the spectrum are finally generated. And by homological stability, we know that the homology as n goes to infinity and you get in any given degree is equal to a homology group of some finite GLN. So for each fixed degree D, this is an isomorphism. For N sufficiently large. That's what homological stability buys us. So we just need to prove that these homology groups are finally generated. Okay, and um, this is a consequence of result of Burrell and Serre. So what they proved is that um, this is homotopy equivalent to a CW complex with finitely many cells in each dimension. Uh, 
I mean, strictly speaking, they proved it for torsion free, torsion free subgroup, but it implies this. And of course, the CW complex with finitely many cells in each dimension has finitely generated homology groups. So, yeah, this is some kind of reduction theory for arithmetic groups. So, in some sense, it's a the theoretic statement. But the conclusion is that the homotopy groups of this spectrum, these K groups of the integers that people like to study, that they're finally generated abelian groups. So that's an application of homological stability for uh, GLNCs. Now, in the notes, I've even given a further generalization of this. So you can define K-theory for not just rings, but also for ring spectra. And probably the most important example of a ring spectrum is the sphere spectrum. So you could define K-theory groups of the sphere spectrum. And uh, in the notes, you can find the argument that the K-theory groups of the sphere spectrum are finally generated as well. And that uses a generalization of this homological stability result that I stated a while back. So, so far we've mostly been talking about homology with integral coefficients. And if we change the coefficients, we maybe made them a different abelian group. But you can also take local coefficients. So replace Z by um, a module, a ZGN module, and that has a non-trivial action. And it won't be true that any sequence of local coefficient systems is going to have homological stability. Um, but the ones which you can prove it are either abelian ones or polynomial ones. And Given the time, I'm not going to define what these are. This is just to point out to you that in the cases that you have homology, a sequence of homology groups where the coefficients are not constant, there's still a chance that they have homological stability. Um, and as the example of KT of the sphere spectrum shows in the notes, that's often very useful. Okay. So Maybe I'll stop here for today, but let me say what I'm going to talk about in the last lecture. Um, the last lecture is basically going to be about the following question. What can you say if there's not, if homological stability doesn't hold? And the answer is going to be that there's several other stability phenomena that could still be true. And I'm going to talk about two of these that sometimes are true. Um, one of them is going to be representation stability. Um, and the other one's going to be secondary stability. So the next lecture will be about these more subtle notions of homological stability that have been the subject of much recent research. Um, okay, so let me stop here and uh, I'll answer any questions people have and make sure that the notes get uploaded so you can read. Well, first of, of all, let's thank him. You can unmute yourself or you can use the applause icon for both. Okay. All right, questions. Um, I 
have one little question. You have this condition of injectiveness of map from pouch A to the direct sum of B, so I suppose that goes for all B. Um, but do you need this only for direct sums of X? I mean, do you just use it in that case, or is it more subtle than that? No, you just use it in that case. Yeah, I should. Okay. I could have written it like that. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Perhaps there was. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a good question. Uh, that's maybe how I should have written it. And perhaps I had another question. I'm not sure if you're talking about this, but this object that you construct to this WNAX bullet, um, does it does it imply stability, or can you say something more that it's sort of, you know, it that it's highly connected if and only if stability holds in some sense? Like, can you say something like that? Um. I don't think you can. So first of all, the only thing you ever be able to prove anything about is homological connectivity, if you only have homological input. But even that, I think, I don't know where you can conclude that. I would, would doubt that you can. I think this is a stronger condition than, than having homological stability, but I'm not completely sure. Okay. Other questions? In, in this theorem, uh, you say that k should be at least two. So, are, yeah. what I mean, the the triangles you looked at looked like if they had slope a little between minus one half and minus one, you would still get some arguments to go. So, is is there a, a reason why you cannot have k slightly less than two in this theorem? Um. Good question. Um, I haven't tried to see whether what exact spectral sequence argument inductions you can still make work if you have a lower k. Somehow, sort of logic from like a sociological point of view, I would imagine that you can't, without additional assumptions, easily make improvements simply because nearly all the homological stability results have slope one half by which i mean k at least two um unless you use like some more complicated tricks so if there's an easy way to somehow get a spectral sequence argument to work um then i would imagine someone would already found it but that's of course not a great argument that just it could just be that no one really tried to i would say that you tend not to be able to prove these connectivity results when k is not an integer uh, just because the inductions don't seem to work well in those cases. But there are many cases like where you know that k is, you can take k to be one. And the argument as written will not give you a slope one stability result, but maybe with some additional tricks you could do something. Thank you. Other questions? Do you know if uh, this last application was the original motivation of Quillen to study homological stability? Um, maybe I shouldn't speculate on what his motivation was, but um, his proof was slightly different, I should point out. So Quillen proved this statement first. Um, his statement was slightly different, but maybe in spirit somewhat similar in the sense that it again reduced to Burrell Serre, but it somehow did like a, did like a Poincaré dual version of, of this statement. Um, it turns out that the CW complexes that they construct, at least in the torsion free case, um, are actually like manifolds with boundaries, so there's some kind of Poincaré duality there. Um, I would imagine that understanding the homology of general linear groups, either of like Dedekind domains or fields or something, was a motivation of Quillen. Yeah, it seems what it's like based on the notebooks. Thank you.
more questions? I mean, if you look at his notebooks, I guess he, where he, where he explicitly writes down homological stability, stability results is for general linear groups over finite fields. But then, of course, he computed everything there, at least in the range that was interested, interesting for him. So in, in the end, uh, he didn't need it for his K-theory of finite fields paper. But some of this early history of homological stability is a bit murky. Uh, I can tell you more about it if you're interested. But I once tried to figure out exactly what the history was by just asking people who were around at that time and writing papers about it. And there are stories that people don't really remember. Thank you. Like for example, there's some papers that say that like, Oh, Quillen taught a course on this type of material. But no one seems to remember attending that course. Who was a student at that time, so. I don't know what happened. Sander, do you think that um, like these two conditions that are in the screen right now, like having finitely generated K-theory groups for a given group ring and having a finite type uh, Borel cell compactification for, its, for, for BG, BGLN would imply um, homological stability for um, BGL of that group ring. I'm not sure you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, well. Um, I don't know any examples where the classifying spaces are homotopy given to finite CW complex with finding many cells in each dimension. Um, they don't know homological stability, so. I mean, I think if you're gonna prove a result like that, it almost sounds like you're gonna prove it by like classifying the rings that have this property or something. <laughs> and then checking that they all have homological stability. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. You can't use like a trick where you, for symmetric groups as a trick where you say, you know that the stable homology is finally generated and you know that all stabilization maps are injective, which means that at some point the homology group have, groups have to stabilize because they can't keep going uh, infinitely many times. But um, in fact, the lecture notes we have an exercise that show that in a particular an example of, of general linear groups show that the stabilization maps are not injective. So you can't use a property like that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, could I ask one last question? Yeah. Um, the the um, category UG that we wrote, is that a left adjoint in some sense? Like, is that construction left adjoint to something? Or is it just coincidental that you're writing in UG? I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, it was introduced by Quillen and had a different name then. Uh, I think it's maybe called something like, probably someone can correct me. Maybe called something like GG. Because there's a generalization where you replace, it's like G acting on itself in this case, and you can replace it by G acting on another category. Um, and this notation maybe less suggests that it's some kind of joint, but I don't know off the top of my head, I'd have to think about that statement. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not really relevant. Okay. I'm not completely sure whether that's a notation, but something like this. Mm. 
another question? Okay, if not, then we will wrap it up here for